discussion of Jackson County Codified Ordinances Chapter 294, the hearings officer. And um, my request for this discussion about Chapter 294 um, recently stemmed from a complaint I'd received about a, um, a hearing. And I know um, everybody's listened to it. However, this discussion isn't about a particular case, about a particular hearings officer. Uh, in my opinion, it's not about uh, any particular staff or those who do our job, their job at holding our ordinances. But when I understand the hearings officers are also used to hear um, staff appeals for staff decisions on type 2 or 3 land use permits, and those are in Chapter 3 of our LDO, and it's not about that either. It's strictly about Chapter 294. And uh, when I requested this to be on a discussion, I asked that... Um, the staff not be invited in to interject or influence our discussion. And um, my request for that, because when I had requested earlier to discuss about a dam removal, I mean, the room was full of uh, water policy people to, to combat that. I just wanted a discussion with our board. And um, I know Commissioner Strasser and Dyer requested that Ted Zook be here as Acting Director of Development Services and um, I, you know, I honor that as well. But I, I like to say, I just wanted our opinion as a board over Chapter 294 um, and the history of it um, was created in 2003 by the board, by the Board of Commissioners, as an experiment in creative adjudication. And these meetings in 2003, there's at least five of them. That, um, that are on a um, DVD that we're trying to get put to a CD that tell the history, and um, it would be very valuable, I think, for our board to, to hear into those as this was being created. And in my opinion, I can bet money was a driver. Um, courts were cutting days, and I don't think that's the case now. Um, $20 per case was being retrieved from the county, and the rest of the money was going to the state, as I understand it back then. And um, um, it is an ordinance we inherited. It's a, and it is a, a, a service that's given under, I guess, just our um, supervision, which is, isn't being, or our accountability, I guess. Daniel Joyful told me that the commissioners are accountable entities for this Chapter 294 hearings officer position. And the ordinance states that the hearings officer shall be appointed by the Board of Commissioners to serve at the pleasure of the Board of Commissioners. And I, um, I didn't even know the guy's name of the, of the hearing we listened to. Um, and that's a function we're accountable for. So I feel like I'm kind of left in the dark as to who's serving there and what our purpose is in this um, performance. Uh, I. I assume you guys got a copy of the audit report from 2016. There was an audit performed on this, um, on the hearings officer's uh, uh, performance and different um, measurements that were given. And the number scene, that I'd like to look at first, seemed a little bit difficult to understand. And of course, I've asked for more information or clarity. But I'd like to say the fines paid, they on page uh, 14 of this report, the fines were paid for about a year and eight months, and it gives an account of about $100,000 in collections over that time. And it says with an average collection of about 68%. So over that time, that's I was great at that was we with a D of 68%. Yet on page 13 of this report, there are substantially less fines collected for between the years of 13 and 15 of about 50,000, which um, if, and I'm not sure if we mentioned apples to apples, and Danny was checking on this, if what was collected, uh, reported on 14 is back fees, but what's reported on page 13 was current fees, it, was, it should have included what was collected altogether, I guess, in my opinion, but that would be $50,000 that was collected in the month of January of 2016. So, just to clarify this, I sent yes. you all a very detailed explanation of why that occurred. Uh, in writing, if you have an email, I don't know if Commissioner Roberts didn't see it or I not, did, but, yeah. but I did send it to you. And essentially, what happened was we migrated software programs okay, from the old system right. to the seller. It migrated all of the past in one chunk, because that's how it 
migrated the data. And I don't know if you all, if you commission staffs are there, I remember reading this, and maybe you have the email that I sent. Yeah, I have it here. Um, I also remember saying a lot about the Estella issues. The Estella issues were added as well, yeah. Right, so that amount represented multiple years of collections migrated at one time, which I did explain that. Yeah, you thought that was probably the case. Right, and it was, and I did verify that with both audit and IT. And I sent you all a succinct. Uh, but do you know how many years of back collection? It said in the email. I didn't bring the email because I didn't. Oh, I thought sorry. I already answered the question. But, oh, okay. Um, I can. I can. I still seem confusing. Yeah. I guess. So no, here's the email that I sent to the three of you, and you all are listed on the email. Oh, I believe you. Um, I got it right here. The second table, which was the payment of fines by size, uh, June 2014 to June 2016, misleading because it includes fines collected prior to June 2014, which is what I told you about. Mm -hmm. Cases dated back to 2001 were migrated to development services when it changed from Tidemark to Acela in June of 2014. So that represented cases going all the way from 2001 to 2014, moving in the collections for those. Um, these cases were included in the Table 2 analysis. Audit should have made it clear to the reader. So audit, oh, you know... Mean. Excuse me? I do remember reading that, yeah. Okay, so, and coincidentally, a large amount, 48000 you said fifty, but it was 48000 collected between June 2015 2016. This period was included in the second table, but not the first. The first table had the years of 2011 and 12 through 2014 and 15. So, you know, audit didn't provide you every detail of every number. They provided you a summary of information, which is what they do in an audit. But I did go back and check the detailed information, and that's why the difference occurred. Yep, and that table from 2013 to 15 is actually $50. Well, this is the one that was collected between 2015 and 16, not 2013. But that was included in the second table, but not the first table. When I looked mm -hmm. at that table and saw that, I figured it had to be back. It's only $100,000 so, yeah. in so, 13 years. So how, well, that, that was migrated in data. Oh, okay. I, mean, I don't, so I don't know what data was captured or not back in, I wasn't even here. Okay. I mean, so I, I can't tell you, I can tell you that that was the data that was migrated. I can't tell you really that that's what was collected or not. Okay. We're talking about a software system that, you know, is almost 20 years old. Right. And, and that's why I think it's important to talk about this. This was before any of us were here, that this was created, this information's being analyzed and collected. But just even in the information, um, that they gave on page 13, uh, 52 cases in 14, 15 went before the hearings officer. 35 percent had been had yeah. been selected so far. There are 35 cases. Mm -hmm. So let me just offer a little explanation about collections. Yes. People don't typically come in and write a check for how much ever they're fine. They come in and try to get put on a payment plan. And I tried, I did explain this to Commissioner Roberts, but not to the other two of you. It's not unlike property taxes. When I do the budget for property taxes, I put budget for prior collection of prior year property taxes. A lot of people don't pay all their taxes in the first year because it's not until three years that they're delinquent. And we put people on variable payment plans depending on the amount of fines that they're assessed and their ability to pay. So and it's an individualized payment plan, so it's not, not everyone gets the same payment plan. It's based on a set of factors. So some people could take 10 years to pay a fine if that's what they're capability is to pay. So the fact that we would only collect a certain percentage in a year doesn't necessarily represent that it's uncollectible, although it may be uncollectible, but it also represents the fact that not everyone's capable of paying the fine immediately, and we try to work with people to mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, whatever their circumstances are, that they can pay over time. That's why we have prior year collections. One of the reasons why we have prior year collections. We also have prior year collections because we place liens, and so when people sell property or do something, we get a chunk of money. And uh, so there's multiple ways that can represent the fact that we may have only collected a certain percentage in a year. Yeah. And it's great. That is one of the uh, ongoing issues is that just because a hearings officer or even a court, for example, were to issue a fine doesn't necessarily mean that someone's going to come through and actually pay the fine. And, co and currently, uh, Development Services has a collections contract when people are not paying to pursue collecting the money pursuant to those fines. Um, and so that... that just be, again, just because there's an order for a fine doesn't mean that there's a collection. I don't have to think too. I mean, the, the very, very basic goal here: if somebody is on a payment plan and they're actively paying the fine to whatever level they can afford, they're probably also in compliance. I mean, they probably also have. 
Uh, uh, I would say that that, that that is that is probably there's probably some correlation, but not a one to one. Okay. So just because someone's paying a fine doesn't necessarily mean they've come into compliance. Um, that has come up uh, more since the marijuana um, yeah. issues. Okay. Is some That's true. some marijuana violators have, have called it the cost of doing right. business. Right. No, I get that. Um, and so that that's not necessarily the case. Okay. So, um, and I know we've talked about the money issue. I think it's been brought to our board. They wanted to double it, you know, to twenty thousand, um, um, just I'm because just, of the marijuana. Okay, you said they wanted to double it. The board instructed staff to bring some options to the board for consideration. I don't want to... I'm sorry. It was represented to bring trustful for discussion, um, that option of doubling that mm -hmm. maximum fine to 20000 I mean, we had the discussion on it. Yeah. And, um, and so we've talked about the many issues. I, I'm... We are out, We don't have control over them. We don't know who's in compliance, who's out of compliance, and we don't need that um, control either. But we are. We are. We have only. Joel is in charge of this, of the hearings officer proceedings. Danny isn't. Ted Cook isn't. It's us. Absolutely. And and I have an issue with continuing with Chapter 294. That fiduciary responsibility of the county and um, to the county taxpayer. But as a representative and a fiduciary responsibility to the citizens of Jackson County, there are a multitude, in my opinion, and I know it's past uh, case law muster, but the constitutional missions that are inherent to administrative hearings, a right to jury trial, right to Article Three courts, right to an elected judge, right to face your accuser, right to an appeal court. You can appeal it to circuit court. It goes to a writ of review. You, they do not get a de novo trial, which just reviews whether or not our proceedings followed our rules. So, and there's no separation of powers. The, the citizen comes in, the county is their accuser, the county is their prosecutor, and the county is their judge. And I have an issue with that. And it was all discussed back in 2003, which is why I'd like you guys to hear it. Yeah. I'd like um, to, do that. to see how that was set up. Yes. Just to get some context, and, and the reason, I guess, for the hearings officer, and so the hearings officer is just there to enforce and, and adjudicate violations of the code that the Board of Commissioners has adopted. And so um, the, the county, um, through its police power, has adopted various codes and regulations relating to what people can and can't do on their property. Right. You know, how many chickens they can have in White City, I think, is one of the first things I heard about when I moved here. And so, in general, it's the board who's adopting those violations. And there are some counties that don't use the hearings officer, and every violation is, is heard in a public hearing before the board. Um, you know, and so I think we had 150 some hearings, and so in theory, if we got rid of the hearings officer position, um, we could bring all violations to the board. At which point, that would be a board's decision to then, if, if the board made a violation decision, then someone could appeal it through a writ of review process to the circuit court. That could be an additional way. Um, you hear about other counties. You know, I think there was an issue out in Klamath County a month or two ago about an animal control violation, and that went before the Klamath County Board, and they made a determination on whether or not someone was a dangerous dog. And so, in reviewing this back in 2003, the Board of Commissioners decided that they wanted to delegate the, the obligation to care about violations of the county code to the hearings officer. And so, it's really a delegation of the Board's authority to adjudicate violations of its code to the hearings officer. Um, so, the hearings officer is sort of empowered by the Board to to make those decisions, getting rid of the hearings officer um, would either bring it back to the board or likely, you know, we could, we could enforce it through circuit court proceedings, um, which is a little different than an Article III court, um, because the Article III court is more of a federal court, and so this is, federal courts wouldn't have jurisdiction over this. Um, but we could, you know, but that would likely involve, um, you know, and additional resources. I, I do want to say something just because I, I understand that we need to be, we have a fiduciary duty, but the goal of code enforcement should not be money generations. It should be trying to get compliance. And so I, I it, it, we, it, it's, it, there can be some constitutional concerns about if we're using code enforcement for the purposes of, of generating revenue. 
And so I, I would have some concerns if, just to buy the board device if we're just looking at this as a dollar and cents issue and does it make does it make money for itself? Um, that's where some of the recent uh, Midwestern cities have gotten into a lot of trouble with the federal government is that they were using code enforcement traffic tickets as a, as a means of funding um, those programs and other parts of the government. I think we made it very clear during those discussions that the policy decision of increasing the fines is never to increase revenue. It was only to increase voluntary compliance. No, we because were voluntary ready. compliance was not being accomplished with some of the new activity we have going on here. <clears throat> with the existing fines, like, like you mentioned, they looked upon those as the cost of doing business. So. It wasn't necessarily to increase revenues. It was. I never said that. No, I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> just saying that that's uh, that, that was always the policy consideration, not to increase revenues, but to increase voluntary compliance, which was diminishing because we had a little different type of activity than we're used to that we needed to react to, because there's a lot of conflicts that were being. And so, Joel, about uh, going to the hearings officer in 2003, what did they do before that? Do you know? Uh, it's difficult to say. It looks like some of them went to circuit court. Um, it, I have been unable to find out who prosecuted those, um, and so I, I do not know who prosecuted them, whether it was the DA or, one, or someone from a count, county counsel's office. Um, because it would be in circuit court, it would have to be a licensed attorney, and so we would, there would need to be you know either county resources to the DA's office or my office. Um, to prosecute those uh, 150 citations. Again, I, I've tried to find this over the years. What was the level of citations before that? I mean, 150 citations is three a week. Um, that, that's, a, that's a body. Well, and we, I guess that's been looking forward until we decide we want to move forward. I think there's a lot of different options that can be looked at versus a hearings officer. Oh, but, um, can, can I also just make a few sure. statements? Um, and Joel, weigh in here, but prior boards when they were accused of violating the U.S. Constitution by failing to provide the right to a jury trial where it essentially says at common law the right to a jury trial regarding all criminal and civil matters still remain inviolate. Um, that was quoted multiple times to our board. The part that wasn't interpreted was at common law. I don't know if people know what that means but the courts have ruled that what that means. That means basically at the time the Constitution was written all laws that existed at the time and they have ruled that and Joel, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what Council Prior previously reported to our board, and I want you to know this, that um, <clears throat> it includes any law that's similar to those laws that existed, but land use laws did not exist at the time. Also, you said essentially that we're not following the Constitution and affording people their rights. That's in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So I just want to make sure the board knows this has been tested in court multiple times. I said that as well. As well as, as, well as our ordinance. In fact, this most recent case, um, Thompson filed an injunction with the court prior to their code enforcement hearing. There wasn't an awarded, uh, an injunction awarded at the time the hearing took place. So because there wasn't a court order, our hearings officer proceeded with the case. There's going to be, just so you all know, there's going to be some issues with that case. That case had, I think, four or five people in the public meeting, video and audio recording, which is perfectly legal. However, uh, someone um, has been posted to YouTube actually audio recorded outside of the public forum in the hallway without the consent of individuals consenting to being audio recorded. That's a crime. And that's been reported to the sheriff. Um, uh, you're allowed to video record, but you're not allowed to audio record, except for in a public forum. So inside the hearings place, that's fine. Outside in the hallway, audio recording someone without their consent is a crime. Um, the, the case is still pending as far as I know in terms of the injunction that was requested. Um, our hearings officer ruled on that case. So there's another legal challenge to um, jur your jurisdiction over this matter in the way that you've created the system. And I say you, meaning I understand you inherited that system. Also, I want you to know I wasn't here when the system was created. And, so, and that's um, what I wanted the board to discuss. And I didn't want to discuss a particular issue. Just <coughs> this Chapter 294 creation. It was created 14, 15 years ago. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on it, and I just think we, I would like to look at it, look at options of what, different ways to to proceed with that. And um, I don't know what you guys think. Do you want to do that? Well, I want to read it just for the purpose of educating myself. I don't know that there's a need to change it. I don't know if there is. I would like to know what happened, what the decision and thought process was at that time, and how it applies now. Uh, we've also got an audit, and if 
if we're going to retain 294, we need to address some of the issues in this audit, too. Well, my only, my consider, number one consideration overarching everything is that we have an efficient and effective, expedient way of redressing grievances of people out in the county. That's what our ordinances are, are for, are intended for, is to, is to allow somebody who has an issue that they're being affected by somebody else uh, and, the, and the reasonable use and enjoyment of their property is affected and they deserve a, a quick and expedient way to redress that. And right now, I think we have a system that is doing that. It's not a perfect system and I'll tell you what, I don't know any situation in a judicial kind of setting um, that is by uh, design adversarial that everybody comes out happy. Um, but overall, you know, it, it kind of it, it works is the way I see it right now. I don't have a problem looking at it. I, I feel it's very broken. I see the people who want a speedy, efficient resolve to their issue aren't, aren't necessarily getting it. And the people that are facing the violation have no, um, they, they can appeal it to circuit court for a writ of review, which gives them uh, not a, a fresh eyes on the case. It, it gives them a, a, an eye on whether we followed our procedures. And that isn't um, due process for both parties, where circuit court or justice court does give that. And I, I would like to look at other options. Uh, this is something. Did you guys know the name of that hearings officer before you heard the case? No, and you know that. I, 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 would, I. I would agree with you. There's, there's because they do serve at the pleasure of the board. It may be something okay. where we need to have a, 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 a meeting, uh, whatever, quarterly, um, and just kind of touch base with the hearings officers. I mean, I, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Um, talk about what they've seen, you know, and, and discuss um, decisions made. I don't think that's a, an issue. I mean, I don't know. I think as long as the case is over, right? If you're discussing a case that's pending, it could be seen as undue influence. Right. And I don't mean I don't mean walking in the middle of the case and saying, no. "Here's what I think." I'm talking about looking at it and saying, "Hey, here's how you interpreted this." Um, we're not going to, you know, judge. We're judges from judgment, and that's the judgment that they're using. They're taking a look at all the elements of whatever ordinance and violation they're looking at, and then they're, and they're deciding if each one of those elements uh, is proven with the preponderance of the evidence. And that's judgment, and that's something that's hard to kind of Monday morning quarterback. That's what a review or a, an appeal is for. But it, it's not a bad thing for us to look at it and say, you know, how is our policy being implemented? I think that's something to look at uh, to fine-tune it. And just we want the policy. So let, let me say one more thing about is your policy being implemented the way that it is. Since I've been here, there's been a handful of reviews over at the circuit court. Um, the last one I remember, I think, was Bernie Zeminski. And the court upheld that the hearings officer followed your process every single time. So in terms of is there a problem with your hearings officer doing what your policy says they do, the courts have even agreed there's not. Um, I don't know because I don't remember the last time you appointed hearings officers. I think maybe I don't think you've appointed any since Bob's been here. But you two, I think, appointed uh, Rick Whitlock. Okay. I think John at Bukey. least and John Bukey. You actually appointed him. So really, I remember that name. So well, we can go back and look for sure. But I'm just saying, you, you you do appoint them, or prior boards have appointed them. I think the other hearings officer. Um, it might have been before. I, I don't remember. Point. It might have been. Uh, Donald Rubenstein, you did. You guys didn't appoint, yeah. but you all know that he's your the hearings officer. The other thing is when you made the comment that you don't know about fines or fees or those kind of things. There's all sorts of things that you're responsible. I mean, technically, you're responsible for, you know, everything that goes on in every department, but you don't know all of those facts. But if you wanted to know those facts, we do know them. We know who owes what and who's paid what and how much they paid and how much they own and whether they're in default or not. We know that. If you want that information, that's not typically a policy uh, issue. That's administration. But I'll, I'll, we'll get it for you. You're welcome to well, see it and review it any time you want. All those departments have directors. The hearings officer has us. Yeah, but we have a code, we have a code, code enforcement falls in our um, community development department. We have an interim director who collects and, and stores all of that data, just like any other department had. So the, the, the hearings officer doesn't track who paid what or who didn't pay what. I mean, you wouldn't get that from the hearings officer if that's what you mean. 
I mean, that goes through the department. So, so that is being monitored. Yeah, absolutely. It's just the hearings officer. The hearings officer imposes position the, imposes the fine or not, and then it's all managed through the department. I mean, and we, I mean, literally, that's public record. Anyone can come in and request that. I mean, other people would have to pay for the time, staff time, that kind of stuff. But if you want to direct staff resources to provide that to you, as I said, you don't you don't ask the justice court who paid their tickets or who didn't pay their tickets. I mean, you, we have this all over the county where you don't know who's been ordered to pay a fine and has. I mean, the justice court's another example of. You know, I'm not over him. He's elected. We're over the hearings officer and that chapter 294. But you are still responsible for the fiduciary authority of the justice court, just like any other uh, agency of the county. So there's no difference in your fiduciary responsibility just because Judge Charter's elected versus appointed. You're still responsible for the fiduciary. Uh, issues in, in oh, that that's office. True. But I, I just look at Chapter 294 as being a little special, accountable to nobody else but the board, and that's why I wanted the board's input on it, besides the fiduciary duty, the, in my opinion, lack of constitutionality that this whole chapter uh, usurps, in my opinion. Well, I just, I want to go back and I want to read the stuff. To me, it, it does seem like it's functioning well. There's very few appeals, but you know, I still would like to know. And if if the consensus is that 294 remains as it is, then we should deal with some other There's, other there's one thing I will not absolutely agree with, though. You are right about the fact that they are serving under us, and we don't know a whole lot about them. And I do think it would be worthwhile and, and beneficial to have occasional, whether it's a, you know, I guess it would have to be a public meeting if we're doing it all together. But, a, but a, a meeting where we discuss if there's a specific issue or just in general what's going on and, you know, maybe we reiterate because this is a new board. They don't know us either. You know, we may have slightly different policy considerations, concerns than previous boards. And, and I think it's good to continue to be able to direct. Um, I don't want to try to, you know, manipulate and puppet map because you have to have, um, you know, a... a Unbiased and uh, impartial judiciary, um, but how do you think it works for separation of powers? I'm not talking about manipulating either, but the separation of powers in that process. Well, we we do oversee and we set policy. Uh, he's only adjudicating our policies, and that's there actually is a separation. So that sort of we can't have. So for example, Danny is responsible for administering the county. So. There would be a separation problem if we put Danny in charge of deciding whether or not people were in violation of the code. And so the hearings officer is sort of created as an independent entity that reports to the board outside of the county's administrative structure to, to rule on whether or not. So that, that, is, and it, that is how we sort of are separating. The hearings officer is a quasi-judicial entity from the county administrative executive functions. Um, just to go back to something else, I would have to use some research. I'm not entirely sure that if, for example, the board decided that this was going to be out of the circuit court, that the circuit court judges would be giving people jury trials on this, so likely these would be bench trials. This would just be a bench trial in front of the judge themselves. Um, I, I, again, I, I don't know, but that's my initial thought would be is these probably would not rise to the level. Not everything that occurs in circuit court gets a jury. Absolutely. And so I, my, my gut feeling, if the, if the board wanted to go down that direction, I'm happy to do some research, would likely be that these would still be bench trials in front of the judge. It still gives the, the defendant or whatever they are an avenue for an real appeal where they don't have a real appeal to a de novo trial. They well, do not have that. Well, and I guess that's sort of, it, it's just going to, it, it's just sort of where the board would like the initial decision to be made. So, for example, if, the, if currently the initial violation determination is made by a hearings officer and the, the appeal is made to the circuit court who then reviews it for procedural or other defects, um, if it were to be at the circuit court, that would be the first bite of the apple sort of parallel to the hearings officer and if someone didn't like the circuit court's decision they would appeal it at to the to the appellate court and so there is no real process anywhere in the law where someone sort of gets two attempts to prove their case and so this is really a discussion of where does the board want to put the responsibility and the authority to make that initial decision um, if it's at the circuit court um, and that then, that then the, the first appeal would be to the appellate court, but then would not give them a de novo review. 
um, just so in this case our circuit court is acting as the court of appeals as opposed to where because we have a hearings officer making that initial decision because no there's no appeal but the judge looks at the evidence and, and then places his judgment or uh, interpretation of the evidence on that appeal it's almost know. always for uh, administrative or, or absolutely. absolutely so it's the same it's just done at a different venue um, and, and as far as you know expediency um our, our audit, you know, by their standards, says that we're handling code infractions in a timely manner. If we try to uh, get these adjudicated through um, t- district court, we would um, circuit. circuit court. Sorry, we got rid of district court. Like circuit, circuit court. <laughs> sorry. Um, we'd be looking at backlogs. I mean, we, we were over there at the uh, the meeting of the review, and it would be backlogs of over a year. And I just agree with that. I contacted Bob Klecker, who emailed me back actually in March after that meeting. I wanted to confirm that. He said civil filings were down in 2016. We had a high of 4,285 civil cases in 2013, then 3,388 in 2014, and just over 3,000 in 2015. In 2016, our civil filings were at 2,207. Civil filings are down. That isn't the case. And I just think... That's where I want um, our citizens to be, be heard, in my opinion. I have a hard time agreeing with our hearings officer, Chapter 294, uh, the way it was established and the way it performs, I disagree with. And I, I that's why I wanted to know what you guys, if you agree with it or disagree with it, how you want to move forward. I just, I don't see how, I haven't heard how necessarily it is going to be substantially more fair, equitable. Uh, people in, in circuit court are unhappy with decisions all the time. There's they have that right. Why, uh, in my opinion, in, in front of a hearings officer, county paid, bought and paid for, presiding over the, whatever it is, uh, administrative hearing it's not a court it's not a court of law and that due process is missing do you think that these judges are looking at a case and just saying hey because the you know code enforcement brought this complaint that i'm just going to say it, it he's guilty he doesn't look I at it on a couple of them the last one i heard he said i'm going to punish you is what he started to say and then he corrected his verbiage and i heard and that and, and, and i have a problem with that it. well yes if, if somebody's up there with an attitude that I just want to punish these people, then that would be something we would need to look at. But I didn't, I didn't interpret it the same way. He, he was talking said, about a, a fine... But like I said, this was not about that. This is about the whole overarching policy of Chapter 294. As I, I think it earlier said, there is, you know, we, we could... The, the, the board is a quasi-judicial board. We could have you know, the board of the commissioners hear these cases and make those determinations. I don't think that is due process either. At all, in my opinion, um, I think people that are fined and uh, against the laws that are set should have that lawful pathway to justice. Well, and you know, the same thing could be said, and I and I'm not going to question any of our judges or hearings officers' impartiality or or you know their. I said due process. Not but I mean, you could say, well, you know, those the judges over there in your building, and you're very cozy with them every day. They're just going to rubber stamp your violations as they come through. And maybe they will, but they're elected. They're accountable to the people. And and we are elected. And if our hearings, and we don't know their names. Well, <laughs> well, we can fix that, but we are accountable to people too. Exactly. And, and that's, and that's what I'm talking we about. Can, we can we can delegate the authority to them, but we're still responsible. That's right. And accountable. Well, so, how would you guys might want to move forward? I, I would... Well, one thing I do want to say is, I, I said the courts have basically upheld our procedures. You know, the, if they do go to court, the courts can still impose your fines. They're not imposing funny. their own fines. But they would also have, just, just so you know, for the citizen, it would be much more costly. They would have the cost of... For both the, parties, the people court. making the complaints? So, sure, I'm just... I'm just to, yeah. I mean, just... It, that's so. It, the, the county is the one who brings the complaint, and it's the county entity. We don't pay filing fees. And but my my guess is is that if it was a circuit court, the defendant would need to pay a filing fee. This is a civil matter, which is four hundred bucks now, just to, to make an appearance in the court. 
Um, and so that would be an initial cost that would have to be borne by the defendant, um, but not by the county as we don't pay filing fees under the court's rules. And so that would be an additional cost to the defendants to participate in that system um, unless they didn't participate, at which point the circuit court judges would issue default judgments. There, there's probably a whole lot of stuff if you want us to look in, too. We, we will. I mean, I don't, I don't have any ownership over the way you're, you're doing it. I don't really, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. But, you know, um, I know that costs matter to you all. You all talk about that all the time. Uh, when you move it over to circuit court, it's just kind of like the justice court versus circuit court. Mm -hmm. The cost is exponentially higher because they got four people that sit in court as opposed to one person in our justice court. Also, as opposed to, you know, the, hearings officer here. Um, the, the other thing is they did the Judge Gerken did say at the state of the court address last year that they're nine months out to a first hearing. So that that doesn't even remedy the case. That was nine months out to the first hearing when they you know it's evidentiary essentially and then they set a, a, a date for a trial. A trial could be a judge trial, not a jury trial. Um, and so the length of time also is something that I've heard you I'll talk about. So let's say that their caseload dropped in half for a year. Instead of nine months, it's four and a half months to a first uh, hearing. Um, and then they set a trial uh, usually months later. So uh, the other thing is most people who go to circuit court, most people don't really know how to represent themselves in that kind of setting. And they probably likely would hire an attorney, which is fine. I mean, they're allowed to hire an attorney here too, but it's much more structured and formal there. And they're not able to recover their costs if they're not um, uh, you know, if they're found in violation, they don't recover their costs. And even if they're not found in violation, they don't recover their costs. So, you, you know, when our hearings officer doesn't impose a violation, which has happened, uh, they don't pay the $250 minimum fine. So there are, there, there are cost consequences for doing that. And I don't care. I'm just telling you, I, it doesn't matter to me. Either way, whatever you want to do, we'll look at doing um, but I don't think the issue of timeliness is addressed, which is something that you all three brought up. I also don't think the issue of cost is addressed. And to go back to talk about the fiduciary or financial issues, I'm just going to say this because it's been alleged multiple times that the county does this for money. The biggest majority of the cost of code enforcement is borne by the solid waste fund. I think it's over 80%. The fines in the code enforcement budget last time reported in the budget process represented 6% of revenues. So it's not a money maker for the county. It costs the county money to have code enforcement and to have hearings officers. It costs the county money. The cost of the hearing, if the person is found in violation, you need, this is contained in the audit, is borne in the minimum fine. So the cost of conducting the hearing on average is $200, right, $250. The minimum fine is $250. So when there is a violation where the people are, whoever it is, is found to have been in violation, the minimum fine is imposed, the cost is of just the hearing is covered. But that also doesn't cover the cost of code enforcement at all. The, the actual citation, the notice of violation, the citation, the multiple trips out to the properties to view the dealing with the complaint, the dealing with the person who's alleged to have violated. And so um, I, 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 I want to say that because you talked initially about the fact that there was a um, financial motive to do it this way. And if that was the case, if there was, I, there may have been. I, I didn't say that. I said an audit. We talked about, yeah, that, that money was a driver. But um, the well, you audit did, report you said, said that, that, only, that the county only got $20 of the money. In, the, in 2003. Right. I don't know what they get now. And that is substantially less than even the minimal, you know, average of, what, 10, 15,000. That was above the hearings officer cost in the audit. Um, Twenty twenty dollars per case is significantly less than that as well. Yeah, well, that we were getting. Right, and I'm not attributing this to you. I'm saying that you said the decision back then was made, so don't yeah. take one. Oh, that's what they say, and they talk about expediency and that the only twenty dollars from the cases are coming to the county, and they will look at different ways. Right, to and what, what I'm saying is, if that if that was a motive, if that was a motive, it didn't turn out to be that. And they that said if that doesn't, if it doesn't pay for itself and it isn't financially, they would come back to the commissioners to be reviewed and to okay. to remove it. I mean, that was another well, commissioner. Let me ask you this. If, if this were making things appreciably more efficient and more expedient for the, for the people who are uh, making the complaints and the people who are 
subject to the violations, would it be worth something to the county if there were general fund expenditures that, that went into this, as opposed to them having to wait a year, pay more costs? Um, and again, I don't think there's any guarantee that over there it's, it's going to be you know, any, any more fair, any more equitable trial. And actually, I think we lose accountability. We lose the ability to review, because if we send it over there, we can't review with that what the, the judge over there decided. Here we can look at that hearings officer and say, you know, not really liking um, some of the things that we're hearing out of this, this hearings officer and let's replace him and, uh, and appoint someone else. We do have um, some control, some accountability to that system. In the, in the way it is. And believe me, I have no vested interest in, in having hearings officer. All I know is that we have double or more the number of code violations we've had in previous years. So we're going to have even a bigger log of these cases to be heard. Well, I don't know where to start with what you just said, but um, do I think we should fire a, a hearings officer because we don't like their decision? No. And that's not what I meant either. Okay. Um, I've been to a few of the hearings. I don't like how any of them ran. It's a, an embarrassment. It's not... Um, from what I've seen, they get up there and they try to plead their case. I've been to court, and you may not like the decision of court, but you have a process, and you have uh, a procedure that, that gives some honor and credibility to making an important decision that affects two people's lives, at least. And um, to make it faster and more expedient, I think, to forego our Constitution, no. Well, I'm not, I'm not ever suggesting foregoing the Constitution. I don't think that's what it does, but I also think... It does for the people that have been affected by it. But, but the people that are affected by some sort of a violation that's occurring next to them, and they're dealing with this for several years why this is being adjudicated, and they're continuing to have to deal with the problem when it can be dealt with quicker, I think is, you know, that's an infringement on their right. I, I was that's seeing just order. like in the marijuana that it's been a quicker, or in, in many of the uh, solid waste issues, it hasn't been quicker. But we don't it's know. It's gone on forever. We it hasn't been quicker due to some of the own, our own policies and how we've dealt with it. And board of commissioners, that's why I preface this with: if we keep 294, we've got to look at that audit recommendations in there because there are things that we're doing that have caused some of these delays. I think it's a process that's called cause these delays where a court could, could find closure to well, them. Faster, at this point, in my opinion. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I, I did provide you all to the hearing data, and I know that you're focused on 294 and code enforcement, but I don't know how the same logic wouldn't apply to any code that you enforce. I mean, why would someone in animal control not have the right to go before a judge and argue their case about their animals? Absolutely. Why would someone who's cited for a public health violation? not have the right to go before a judge. These are all your rules. They're all your policies. You adopt these ordinances and you adopt the process. So, you know, when you add all of those together, I mean, the Board of Commissioners could hear them. As we said before, you, you'd just become a hearing body and that's all you would do all day long. But, you know, I could certainly see the court being overwhelmed when you consider all of the things that, that really, under, your, under, under the logic that you're explaining, I don't know how you would parcel out this from every other every other imposition of code violations. Um, and honestly, the sheriff issues code violations, the sheriff's deputies issue code violations too. I mean, they're, they don't always cite people in the court, you know, and sometimes they'll call, you know, someone's holding an event and they don't have proper uh, approvals for um, solid waste. They'll call Health and Human Services and public health will go out there and cite them. And why doesn't that person have the right to go over and stand before a judge? I guess that's not in Chapter 294, but I guess if the logic is what you're saying, there's a whole lot of stuff that probably you all should address. I don't know why you would just choose to address this. I choose to address just this for now. It's a step in the right direction in my view. And I just think people, citizens, ought to have a process when they are the ones that are being cited and they feel wronged or they they should have a... a it's justice court or circuit court or some body other than the, the accusing body hear their case with no with nothing but a writ of review as a possible outcome. Well, everybody has the right to procedural due process, and our hearings officer um, process does meet those standards, or they or they wouldn't be. They don't have the right to due process. They can't, they can't have a jury. They can't have a that's elected judge. That's not part of due process. 
that's a different due process. What do you call different. due process? Well, due process is to find a process that meets the minimum standards of fairness with a right to be heard. Notice and a right to be heard. Notice and a right to be heard. That's it. That's due process. Well, they should that's have it with hearings officer. <laughs> they could be heard. <laughs> and then they could be to find the Well, I don't think that that's the cursory and, and way it's happening. And, and I mean, like I said, I don't have a vested interest in keeping these hearings officers. I have a vested interest in making sure or doing whatever we can to make sure that people who have issues can can have some redress in a, in a timely fashion. And that's all I'm really talking about here. It doesn't make us money, and, that, and that's not ever a consideration. Um, but people, especially now, we have complaints daily about issues that are going on. Now, granted, we don't have the enforcement to even go out there and you know, give the code violations that are necessary, but at least we have the ability, I believe, still to process them through much more expediently. Because from what I, you know, if there's 2,000 cases and we dump another 200 on them, that's 10% more, that slows the process down that much more. And, and it will become... And that's not our only option. We have justice court. We have circuit court. I mean, we, I can't see discussing options if you're not li- willing to look at options. Well, if you, um, if you are arguing for a jury trial, there aren't jury trials in justice court. I mean, they can appeal to a circuit court from justice uh, court. Justice court's not a court of record, so it wouldn't be an appeal. What it would, would it be? It, it, it would be a, a removal of the case and a filing in circuit court. Okay. So, and... They don't have a pathway. Well, and, and I guess it is, if the concern is, can, can we provide a jury trial, a trial of your peers for code violations? My, my gut instinct, and like I said earlier, I'd have to do some research, is I don't think that circuit court is going to be the pathway to that. I don't think the judges are going to order a jury trial um, over county code violations um, because it's not something to which a jury trial has attached. We could, in theory, I say this um, with some trepidation, um, if we want to provide a, a trial by jury for code violations, is if that's a concern that the commissioners have, the way to do that would be to create a, an almost a jury trial, a, a county hearings officer jury, because um, that would be the only real venue where we could guarantee a trial. And I don't even know the mechanism by which we would call a jury or do any of that, but my, my gut feeling is that, for example, if we had... Well, there would be no statutory authority to call a jury. Right, I, I know. That, that's why I'm saying, like, with some trepidation, like, but my, my, my instinct is, based upon my years of experience, is, is that, for example, if we were just to do away with the hearings officers and we would have, you know, county counsel or the district attorney, and I, I didn't look to see how we did it back in 2003, make a filing over the circuit court, um, that just because it's in certain court doesn't mean a jury trial attaches, and these are not jury trial things, as been, has been determined by the Oregon Supreme Court. So even it would just put it in front of an elected judge, which is absolutely something you know separate from the county. But there would there is no venue or a way that I think that we could actually well, have how about this? If, a trial by jury for county code enforcement violations. If the commissioners were able to review a case and decide if it warranted a de novo review of the commissioners? Well, then, no, it, it, it could only work. I'm just trying so essentially if the commissioners, so if we, if it, so currently the hearings officer is the final decision of the county, mm-hmm. it would have to make, it would be similar to, similar, but may, I would have to do some research to land use in the sense that it could be appealed to the, so the planning commission is a better example. Planning commission makes recommendations. I mean, but it, I don't think the commissioners could pick and choose which ones they wanted to hear. Yeah. I think um, anyone who wanted to appeal it could bring it to the commissioners. And what would happen is everyone who well, wants would appeal it. Would be, yeah. And I yeah. think that you know, what you're talking about is trying to recreate it, reinvent the wheel. I mean, we have a system like that set up in circuit court where it gives people whatever options they want for their justice. Whereas in the hearings officer, they lose that. It, and that's just my view. And that's, and but it, they don't have the right to a de novo review in circuit court either. It, it, that is not the automatic appeal process. It's, it's based on procedural or you know, other issues when you appeal. They're not, I don't, they're not re-looking I don't at the too. facts of the case and, and making a judgment in an in a appeal. 
Right, so an appeal from the circuit court goes to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals is not looking at the facts. They're not a trier of facts. They're just a determiner of process and law. So really, it, it's just a question of who do you, who does the board want to make that initial violation decision? Is it going to be a county board appointed hearings officer, or is it going to be a circuit court judge? But there's really only one opportunity for a defendant to contest the facts of their case. There's no, there is no de novo reviews. There's just the initial determination, and I guess that's the question for the board. And, you know, I, I don't, it, it can be done, you know, what's the, you see one county, you see one county, is that enough to argue? I mean, we can come up with whatever the board wants to do. You know, that, that's really what my goal is, is if the board makes a decision, I try to find a way to legally make it, put it together and make it work and make it, you know, so we can defend what we want to do. I mean, if the board wants to send it to circuit court, we can figure out a way. If the board wants to hear it themselves, you know, the hearings officer's process, the administrative law process has already been upheld. This is a constitutional process for administrative violations. I mean, it's really whatever the board wants to do. But just some of your concerns, I, I don't think that, you know, for example, I don't think we can get, there's no way to get a jury to hear these. We can't tell the circuit court that they have to call a jury. I would hate to have to try to explain that to some of the judges over there. I don't think that's our call. I think that is what the case goes to the circuit court instead of being heard by the hearings officer. No, that's, that's absolutely, and then it's just a matter of, 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 I mean, we have an obligation as a local government to enforce our code. The, the board has decided to adopt the code. We have an, we can't adopt a code and then not enforce it. That is, that's been firmly held by courts over the years. And so we have a code. It's just a matter of how the board wants to enforce it, how the board wants to allocate the resources to do that. I, I do believe, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Joel, but the, the benefit of getting compliance by going to circuit court is when the circuit court orders someone to do something and they don't, they can be actually held in contempt and it could become a criminal issue for them. Our hearings officer doesn't have the authority to do that. So when you have noncompliance and people refuse to clean something and a judge orders them to do it. It'd be civil contempt, but it's still civil contempt. Yeah, but it would still be a contempt. I, I think they have a lot more teeth to, for enforcement than what we're seeing and, and the citizen has more avenues to make their case, in my view. But having more tools for enforcement means they have to adhere to more rigid standards and they're not allowed, in my opinion, part of code enforcement is, well, the most important is compliance. And when, you know, there's a typical case where you have 50 cars on somebody's property and they're taking, you know, one a month off, it takes a while. Now, the circuit court, you know, would a, would a judgment in circuit court take that in consideration? I don't think so. So that makes it less effective and a lot more draconian to. It's not as user, user friendly. I do, I do also think, Joel, correct me if I'm wrong too, but if someone's ordered to appear even in a civil case and don't, the judge can issue an arrest warrant for them. That I would have to look into. I don't know if you have TL on civil. I know on a civil slander case, people having warrants issued when a judge orders them to appear and they didn't. So, but it's a possibility at least. And it's something that Joel could look at. We don't issue arrest warrants for people in our hearings. So I guess I'll let her, your, your recommendation or what you'd like to do is get rid of the hearings officer and move it all to circuit court. Or justice court. I don't know what those options are and what they would look like. I would have to look to see if justice court would have jurisdiction to do that. Well, they could appoint, I mean, they could essentially use 294 and appoint the justice court as the hearings officer. But it's, it's, but if we got rid of the hearings officer process, whether or not justice court in and of itself is an entity in that regard, I'd have to do some research. Or circuit court. You know what I would like to do is, is to, because I think you're absolutely right. We have, we have very little knowledge. We don't know the hearings officer. I'd like to at least more closely, I don't want to say monitor, but see what's going on. So like maybe we should have the recording sent to us on a regular basis, listen to them and have regular meetings with the hearings officers. And then at that point we can at least make a better, more educated decision on something like this. I see just by an outside looking in, it seems to be working okay. I mean, it's not a perfect system and I know some people come out of there upset, but I guarantee people come out of there upset too. And it may not be 
as fast as people want, but I believe it's faster than what would happen over there. But we could take a more intelligent look at it if we have more information. I, I'm not in favor of getting rid of the system. It seems to be working. I'm willing to look at what happened and understand the mindset of why they did what they did when they first formulated this, because we're, we're casting blind right now. I don't know that information. You haven't been able to get it. So I'm more than happy to look at that and spend the time trying to understand more of that. But the things that have been pointed out about the cost, the timing, uh, all of this, and the responsibility to our constituency about code enforcement, if we're going to have codes, I don't think we throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there are some potentials here to improve it. I would like to know who the hearing officers are. I want to read that material. And then, if we have these concerns, we can address them again. I think that's reasonable. Continue to look at it. Look at it more closely. Yes, yeah, I think it... I think it's in 294. I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I think in 294 it says, you know, if you appoint a chief hearings officer, then that chief hearings officer is responsible for the administration of the program. And if you don't, that I'm responsible for that. That is 294030, and what it says is if we have a hearings officer panel, if one is established, may be established when, within the CEO's office. The panel may, shall be managed by a chief hearings officer if one is established. So you could actually, so currently we have three, we have a hearings officer panel, but no chief hearings officer. Um, you could in, uh, appoint a chief hearings officer who would then be responsible for conducting the administration as, you know, deciding which, which hearings officer gets which case, that, that level of duties currently. We don't have a quote unquote chief hearings officer. We just have a, a, a panel of equal hearings officers, for lack of a better word. And so the administration is done through the annual authorities designee, which is development service. Well, and just to be honest, I have absolutely no involvement in the administration. The reason why I'm bringing this up is at one point there was a question about whether or not, you know, that included appointing hearings officers because the chief hearings officer under that code, I think, has the authority to assign hearings officers. And I don't know if that's interpreted as assign the court or assign the designation of being a hearings officer. And I came back to the board and said, I, I, I won't do it. I mean, I won't do it. I'll bring everything to the board and you decide. So the board's always been the one who has, regardless of the ambiguity in your ordinance, who has appointed hearings officers. I've never done it. I don't want to do it. I don't want anything to do with it. Um, I don't want anything to do with it either. And, uh, <laughs> but, 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 let, let me just finish my thought real quick because there's another option here for you. I mean, not meeting your option, but in the discussion that I'm hearing is, you know, when we need a hearings officer, we advertise for hearings officers, and we have minimum qualifications for a hearings officer. They get reviewed by community development, essentially, and, and recommendations get made to you. But technically, you could do interviews of people that you're going to appoint to the hearings officer. If you want a more close, I'm just telling you, if you want a more closeness to the process of who they are and knowing them, you can do that after the fact, but you can also do it before the fact. And that's all within your authority, within your within the ordinance, the way it exists. I'm just pointing out some things to you if you are going to try to uh, manage it more closely and be more involved, because technically I'm not. I mean, I don't manage it either. I mean, I, I manage it only to the extent that there's staff that set up hearings, and, and that's basically it. Um, the, uh, the ordinance basically directs that of me, and so if there's specific things that you all want, like you talked about who owes what fines and how much, how much we've collected, we have all of that in our system. I mean, we did migrate software systems, and as I said, this existed before I ever got here, so I didn't set any of it up. I also inherited mm -hmm. um, all of that, but I think we have pretty um, good uh, management tools for getting you data for things that you might want to know, besides the hearing meeting with the hearings officer. Um, one of the things that's hard, and it says this in your audit, is that, you know, the board could provide more direction, and, and that's a, a bit ambiguous because it was referencing how you want us to enforce it. The truth is, you know this in your own policy, um, you ask us not to be hard in enforcement. You, you know, if someone has 100 old cars on their property and they're not allowed to have them, if they're removing one car a month, that's compliance. But that doesn't help the person that has to wait 100 months to get the, you know, the car lot cleaned up. And the truth is, is there's, there is discretion in that unless you provide explicit direction because 
And we have had people, you know, some, I mean, I know of one case, a lady was on dialysis living in a single line trailer on a property, had no money, was living off of, you know, uh, disability. And here she is being cited for having all these cars. And, you know, uh, you could you could tell us to immediately move that to a violation. But, you know, we tell staff, work with people as much as you can who want, who want to try to comply. If they just say, no, I'm not doing anything, that's different. But if they say, hey, I don't have money or I'm on dialysis, I can't even get out of bed or, you know, whatever, then every case. So when you ask about compliance, for example, that was one of the things you asked me about initially. How do we know whether people complied or not was what you asked me, I think. And, you know, that is a broad definition because every case is looked at differently in how it's handled because of your direction to staff. So you could literally, and, you know, you've also said don't do active enforcement. So our staff don't go around and drive around and look for violations. If they're on a violation and see one, they'll cite someone for it. But it's complaint driven. But you could tell our staff, go out in the county and cite everything you see and move them right to a violation. And, you know, you, there, there's a, re, a range. This is whether you send it over to circuit court or not. Okay, so this is, I'm not even talking about the hearings officer, I'm talking about code enforcement in general. Mm -hmm. And that's what the uh, recommendation was, was like, hey, you, you've been a bit ambiguous in providing direction in what, you, in what you want, besides just kind of philosophically, you know, don't be heavy handed. And what happens is you get a call from the neighbor saying, I've been dealing with this for five years and there's still cars out here that haven't been moved, for example. And and then you start asking us why isn't this case being you know worked on? I mean basically that's what happens. And usually it's Bob because he's the liaison, and we send him back and we say, hey, we you know we gave him a notice of violation this day. We cited them. We're working with them, but they're only removing one car a month. But that's compliance for you all. So <clears throat> if you, I mean essentially you, you you may not have the hearings officer part. You may decide not to do that or whatever. But you're still going to have code. And so. Um, you know, when you're having this discussion, that's another thing I think that you need to consider is exactly how you want staff to implement your code. Because if you actually read the code explicitly, they should be out there citing everything they see. Now, we came back to the board and said, let's develop a policy handbook. You guys tell us how you want us to enforce this. And that's why we have a separate policy handbook that we've reviewed. I think you two have had it reviewed. We haven't done it with Bob yet. But, you know annually or biannually ever since I've been here we've brought it back to the board and said hey is this still what you want us to do and how do you want us to do it and uh, you know no one wants to pick on people um, but then you get the calls from the ten neighbors around the one person that's feeling picked on and you know it's 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 a it's an awkward position for staff to be in because they're answering to you why something isn't happening quick enough for the neighbors who want it to happen when at the same time you're saying you know don't be forceful with people if they're willing to try to comply kind of thing. So I think that's something else that should be part of your discussion. And I don't know if that, you know, 294 does reference the hearings officer, but it's talking about all those codes that they enforce. And uh, how we how we cite people, if you decide to move this into circuit court or some kind of hybrid of moving it into justice court or whatever you decide to do, how we cite people is going to have an impact on, you know, um, what the outcome is by changing the hearings officer process. Because there's a lot of stuff we, you know, I mean, basically, when someone calls and make a complaint, if we go out there and verify, we give a notice of violation. Because it's against your code. But do you want us to do that every time someone makes a complaint? Or not? You know, a lot of complaints, a lot of complaints are probably retaliatory. They don't like their neighbor, they make a complaint against them. Their neighbor doesn't like them, you know, they make a complaint. And uh, there are those ones where people just can't stand, you know, the the traffic in and out of a place, the old broken down trailers, the cars, the whatever. And there are cases, actually, the, these would be probably the minimal, but there are cases where there are significant health and safety issues. I mean, where people are, you know, there's acid leaking out into the waterway or that kind of stuff. I mean, so there are those where I would guess you would say, be right on a health and safety issue. I mean, we're not going to wait a year while something's leaking acid into the well, we have priority. Bear Creek. And we do in your in your in your policy handbook. They're, they're listed by priorities in health and safety. Well, I think that I actually think they're the first priority. So anything that can be described as a health and safety issue, um, you, you've essentially directed to be more forceful or at least 
make that the priority in enforcement, maybe not more forceful. But so what I would like to see then is I would like to put together, I will work on what I'd like to see um, and bring our plans back and discuss them, how I would like code enforcement to cite people and and how that would be merged into circuit court. And that's going to take um, some investigation on my part. And I don't know if, like, if you guys are just happy <laughs> just the way we are. I'm not happy with it. But, um, I'm not unhappy with it, but I think there are probably some things that we could do that would improve it. And, uh, you know, like you, I didn't know who Yuki was until I watched that tape. And, of course, you know, I realize I'm fairly new. So, Whitlock I had actually met. So, well, and, and I, I, right now, um, like I said, I, I see it working. Again, it's imperfect. It's working, um, but if I can, through more information, be shown that there's a better way to do it, and that it meets all those criteria that we talked about, then I would certainly be willing to entertain that. But I don't know that the ones we've discussed, unless I get a lot more information that that uh, points that direction, that those those are going to uh, to accomplish those goals. But I'd be willing to look at just like anything, give me information that that. Uh, uh, dictates a change of opinion, I'll absolutely do that. I, I heard Commissioner Roberts say she's going to do this individually, but is there anything the board wants us to prepare staff for information for you? I mean, I I don't know if you actually got the 2003 minutes or you just were informed that's what happens, but we could at least we could go back like and see that. I've seen the video, so. yeah. Yeah, we could go back and pull the minutes. Um, I'll get a copy of the video. So um, you deliver it to the Wednesday meeting? Or was it yeah, it was a televised meeting. Right. And there's like five in a row. It's from February to March. Or to May. Well, my guess is it's time. creating the, a chapter in our ordinance. Uh, yes, our ordinance. So yeah. it's a public hearing. There has to be a public hearing. I don't think it would... It may have occurred at a regular board meeting, but... It, it was at public hearings. It was too close. Ultimately, until the until a deliberation item and it was adopted. Yeah. Maybe it's in the topic. On a few of those. On a few of those. Yeah. Well, I'm open to looking at alternative ways. I know staff can give us a recommendation how we go from a siding to circuit court. Um, Would you want to ask, and, and I guess this is, like, so there's probably going to be different costs. Would you want to see, is there any, when you say if you want staff to look at To the see? county? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the cost and the, and the, uh, in the individual defendants, yeah. and sort of what would be the what would be what it look like? Mm -hmm. well, and it's going to depend on whether they get an attorney. But I mean, just the basic. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, so for example, uh, there's a there's no cost for a defendant to appear in front of the hearings officer. Um, <coughs> I will check with the courts, but I am almost positive that there would be a four hundred dollar filing fee. I thought it was two hundred fifty dollars for a hearing. No, no for, for us, our, that's if there's a fine in So we, so we impose a minimum of two hundred fifty dollar fine. But if you go down to the hearings office and you're found, there's no violation found, which, which happens. There's no fine, no cost for the defendant. Um, appearing at, in circuit court costs $400. So even if you're found not guilty, you, because this is a civil action, you pay $400 to be able to stand in front of the judge. Let, let, let me also say something, because this is kind of important. Typically, by the time it gets to a hearings officer, there's not a lot of cases where it's not a violation. And the reason why is because we spent months and months and months usually trying to get people to comply before we go. We don't just fight people into a hearing out of nowhere. Now, there's some people who will say, well, you don't have jurisdiction and I'm not doing anything. Well, you don't have a choice then. I mean, there's nothing we can do. Uh, but there are people who say, well, you know, I'm trying to, to handle this or I'm doing... And so we take months and months. So typically those people, and also the people who say you don't have jurisdiction, which I said before, this has already been tested in court, so people can make that argument. And maybe anyone can go back over to circuit court and make a new argument or get a different judge and get a different ruling. But so far, um, that's not been the case. And, you know, those people are typically found in violation. They just say, you don't have jurisdiction, and therefore I'm not. And they, and well, and that's maybe, it, it would be an interesting process. So if someone says, you know, you don't have jurisdiction, I'm not participating, then there is no, then, then it moves to the county's procedures for a default hearing because the defendant's not right. showing up. And so you can't, you know, say I'm not going to participate and then want to participate. And so 
Um, if you refuse to sort of enter a plea or to engage in the discussion, then um, it moves to the county's default proceedings. And it's interesting in, in comparing cases to cases. I know of another case that I knew someone came to watch the case and the uh, bank attorney or whatever didn't bother showing up. It's rescheduled. It wasn't default. I mean, there's a real lack of well, consistency in how the, um, the rules are being applied. I mean, we can talk about cases upon cases, yeah, but and Ted that may, wasn't my intent. And Ted may be a better person to answer this, or it may not even be Ted, but in my experience, if someone doesn't show up at all, they almost always reschedule whether or not an attorney or not. But if someone shows up and says, I'm not participating, that, that's a difference. So it's just best not to come. <laughs> well, you just try to reschedule. I, I believe they reschedule once, but I would have to do that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I would love it to go to circuit court is my preference for sure. Well, I guess I just want to be clear. Is there anything we didn't ask you to do? The only thing I, I've heard is that you get a copy of uh, 294. Okay. Well, you have of the 94. You know, the, the, the in 2003. Oh, okay. 2003. I'm working on getting that on a CD. And you don't want us to, like, look at sort of what would be processed. I, I, I would like process. to see that, yeah. If, if we were to go to the circuit if court. We, if we can get, I mean, these are going to be estimates. I know that. Estimate of, of time. Oh, and, and, sorry. Yes, and cost. And so, for example, so right now, Commissioner Roberts has said she would like to change the process to, to have hearing cited to circuit court. So is that really the only one that you want? Like, I haven't heard, like, I, I don't want to develop a myriad of possible things right, that you come if, up if, with. <laughs> <laughs> you got plenty to do right at the time. Probably not even a, a possible option. Then I guess I, I would have to look to see if okay. Justice Court. I, I, I mean, think it's a I, I'm happy to look to see if Justice Court is an option. I'm happy to. See, I know Circuit Court is an option. Well, I'll say I'll know it for right now until I see something that I change my mind. But the problem is your ordinance says that they have to have. I think I don't. I'm paraphrasing because I don't know the exact wording, but essentially they have to have knowledge of land use laws in Oregon. Our Justice Court judge probably doesn't have that right now. They could, they, you know, someone who does. So I don't know how it would meet the requirements of your ordinance to refer someone over there. Now, going to circuit court, you're not guaranteed that either. Right. But I'm just telling you what your ordinance says right now is, you know, that they have to be qualified to do hearings, they have to have that background. So, so I'd love to see what would be, and it could be appointing the justice of the peace as a hearings officer could just be referring to him as a justice of the peace. I mean, there's a couple of maybe different ways to get it there. Um, and then looking at sort of what the costs and estimates for time would be if it were to go to circuit court. Um, and then I will probably, and, and I, as part of that, just so you know, I may reach out to some of the other counties just to see what their experiences are as they may be able to give us an and idea of what. Well, um, the the better. Yeah. I do think. You would have to prepare all the legal pleadings and everything that goes to the search for the right counsel and as opposed to the... Oh, yeah, no, that, so that's something I said in the meeting. So if we were to go to circuit court, I don't believe that the code... So currently our code enforcement officers appear because we're not a, a legal court, we're an administrative court. Our code enforcement officers are able to appear in front of the hearings officer and present the cases. Um, that would... I can almost guarantee, but I would have to look um, whether I don't believe that would be possible in circuit court. So it would require a licensed attorney to do that, um, which then is again just an allocation of resources to ensure that we have enough licensed attorneys. I mean, in a, I mean, I think it's a meeting that if we're doing 150, you know, hearings a year, that's three hearings a week. That's at least an FTE, probably more. Otherwise, the tax would need to be included in those. Yeah, those that would have to be sort of looked at, and that's that may be together as far as what the total cost of doing it would be. Yes. Well, and just I know you may not like to hear this, but in order to cover it, you could raise the minimum fines as well. So if there's an additional cost, you could impose additional fines. Because the court, if you go to court, the court's going to impose whatever your ordinance requires. So yes, yeah, so I mean we couldn't just say if you go to circuit court, you have to pay more fine. We just have to increase the fines. That would be a way to help attempt potentially pay for the cost, or um, it could be, you know, the, the general fund expenditure. I mean, another issue for you. It's all about the color of money. Well, I think it's very healthy to look at it. I mean, it was put in as temporary, it was put in as um, creative adjudication, and I think 
I don't know. It's been looked at since 2003. No, it's good to look at. It's clear. I think it's very well, I can tell you it's been discussed multiple times because it's been alleged that the county is violating people's constitutional rights over and over and over. And when people have filed in court, the courts have held that we're not. Um, and I'm not. It's not my interpretation. I'm telling you what other people said. Um, the, uh, the the last time that I was here that it was looked at was when um, commissioners. Smith, Spendrick, and Rasher were here. They had a, let's say, a similar discussion. Um, okay. A similar, not exact, and not the same arguments, but they had a discussion about that's when they asked council to address the issue of are we meeting people's constitutional rights or not? Council reviewed it and presented yes. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but yes, you so are. And so I'd like to see that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if there was a memo. I think there is at least one memo that Rick would want for it. So, yeah, so I guess there's, there's sort of, so I, I believe that our current system is defensible, but that doesn't mean that there can't be a different, better system if the board decides what that's what they want to do. Yeah, and what, I, what I wanted to say is regardless of what some board of commissioners said in 2003, one board doesn't bind another. It doesn't matter if they were going to test it or not, and their, what their criteria was for a test failed or not. Right. It matters what you think. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it really, I mean, we'll, we'll get you the information, but let's say it was a huge success and did everything they said it would do. That doesn't mean you still have to do it. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I'm just considerations of the decision. Is and this would just be for, so we, we have multiple, we have a hearings officer both for code violations and for land use adjudication. So we can't use circuit court to adjudicate land use. That's issues. why I said this is just chapter so, 294. So we would still need to keep 294 to some extent because that's how we appoint a hearings officer to do our land use hearings. Well, I thought that was um, section 3 of our LDO. Yeah, so that's where, our, that's where the process, so there's, so 294 both sets up a process for hearings, but it also sets for how we pick a hearings officer. So we can't just repeal 294. We still have to have a process to pick a hearings officer to heal land use decisions. Because according to the the tape from 2003, they had hearings officers before that. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, but we, we need a way to still appoint, is all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't mean that they have to appear before hearings officer, but 294 also explains how you're going to appoint. How we're going to get officer. one, and we need to still keep the how we're going to get one. So that how we they get one before 294? I, I, I was... Living in Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know that it matters how they got one before 294. What matters is you need a way to appoint a hearings yeah. officer if you're going to keep land use hearings. And okay. also what I heard, I brought this up, but I'm assuming you're going to keep animal control hearings and you're going to keep public health code violations and all of that before a hearings officer because that's what you said when I said, why wouldn't you also consider these? Or is that, yeah, so is that also you said you just wanted to consider this. Just 294. Whatever is in so that would be so that would be the dangerous dog citations. So two ninety four just creates a hearings officer to hear all county violations. And every department, not every department, but multiple departments have you code know. that represent violations. So public health is an example, animal control is an example. So it would be all of those. Yeah, it would be any county. So yes, two ninety four is just sets up a. It's not a. I mean, it's mostly used for code enforcement violations in the sense of development services mm -hmm. violations. But it, all 294 does is create an administrative process that any department in the county who has to administer a code can follow. So if Danny was saying animal control has its animal control statutes in 1062, I'm guessing. Um, but they use 294 to enforce the animal the dangerous dog codes. And so would you want us to look at how, how are we going to have certain courts do dangerous Well, environmental health and public health, we're, we're asking about it all. Um, how many of those cases go to a hearings officer? I'd be curious. I guess if someone I guess, wanted I you, to take I gave you those numbers in the email that I sent yeah, you. I don't know the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Currently, animal control has been had none. Right. Animal right. control had zero. And so, in this year, so this year, in, in animal control may be one of those circumstances that, that there is no way to have circuit court enforce it because we're an animal, we're a dog control district, and so it may be if we don't have a hearings officer delegated to from the board, the board has to hear those dog. I think that's actually what Justin County does. And I, that's almost what most counties do is, is they use the Board of Commissioners is the one who hears animal control violations. Hmm. Um, and so there may not be a method to have circuit court hear those because of the statutes under which we regulate animals in the county. Okay. Well, well we, we need to know to deal with We need to know that in order to develop so do you want to keep, do you want us to look at 
if we're going to get rid of the hearings officers who are in violation, do you want us to look at what would be the cost and expense of doing the animal control via the board or where it would have to go? Or do you just want, right now, you just want to sort of focus on this code in Fort Lake, the, the, the development services code stuff? Yes. Okay. That's what I'd like. Well, yeah, but I mean, the philosophy is the same in either one of those if you're talking about um, their opportunity to constitutionality, all the things you're talking about. But as far as um, expediency, and I mean, I, I would I would prefer to, to keep it at the, uh, the code violations. And, and, and maybe that's just a place to start and have a discussion with some information provided back to the board. I think it takes some in-depth look to to change a whole system. And I think because it's been in for 14 years, you know, it's it's spread out. And I think we have to look at reining it in. And and I'm, I'm glad to look at it. So. Do, do you know, you know, in criminal cases, there's the court finds assessment that has all sorts of assessments just because you go to court, not to do anything else. Is that the same on the civil side? Or no, it's just, the, it's just the filing fee. There's not a civil victim's witness assessment or victim's assessment. It might all be bundled up in the filing fee, okay. but I, I know that the filing fee is the only thing that a, that a person who appears in a civil case has to pay. So I don't know how it breaks down. Yeah. It's like 400 or 400. You should probably find out. Those yeah. Guys. yeah. So we'll discuss it again. When you have the information, I guess. And I, if I well, we'll, we'll get you the. I'll get you the minutes if you're getting the sure. studies. That's fine. I'll have staff pull the minutes from those meetings. Right. Um, and then. Oh, so you want the dates? Yeah, that's fine. Mm. I'll get them. <laughs> there it is on my. A few papers there. I do. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to get those to you. If not, I'm sure we can find them in 2003, right? Yeah. So it's like February 19, it's the first one. Okay. Um, in the in May. Yeah. Wow, I don't know where to put them. Anyway. Well, I'll pull those again to you, and then also I can get you. Uh, it is 5th, 19th of February, March 5th, April 9th, wait, wait, hold on. Did you say the 5th of February? 5th of February. The 19th? The 19th. March 5th? Mm-hmm. April 9th, and May 21st. Okay. I know. Interesting. Because the ordinance was passed on February 19th, so I'm curious as to what the other three hearings were about. <laughs> and then the hearings, it was, it was discussion, okay. yeah. Um, the other thing is I can do this if you want is you know when we uh, solicit uh, requests for people to make application for hearings officer we get applications and information about them so for the current I mean I don't know if you want past ones but at least for the current ones I can pull whatever we have and get you copies of that information if you want um, and, and, yes. currently it's so, and, and I, the contract and, and the the, the through the ordinance, Danny is currently recruiting for a new hearings officer because one of our hearings officers has identified that they are going to stop doing at least part of it. So there is a current RFP out um, that would come to the board. Like Our ordinance is a little bit uh, ambiguous, but the way I read it is that Danny is responsible for recruiting them, you're responsible for appointing them, and then being responsible for contracting with them. Um, and so that's how the ordinance, so there's currently a recruitment um, but even before we had this discussion, um, it would have come to the board for an appointment. But I don't know if the two, if any of you have ever elected the last time this year. It might have been, I think it might well, have been. Well, I think we're, we're locked. They, they appointed Did you guys have, I don't remember if they appointed we did. I don't. I, and you would have appointed John Buki at the same time. Oh, really? And I want to see you guys interview them. No. No. No, I don't think they did. No. But I'm. But, <laughs> I don't I don't that that one. One. but you could interview them. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. maybe I think they're planning commissioners. Yes. Yeah. Work together sometimes. Wow. Well, I'll always get you copies of whatever information we have for the people we have. Um, we, you know, we will be bringing. Well, hopefully. I mean, I, I have to tell you honestly, it's really hard to get someone who wants to be here in the office. When we go out to recruit, sometimes we just get nothing. Um, and then what's happened is the people who are hearings officers, you know, get they get overwhelmed. I mean, we had, at one point we had one. It was uh, 
uh, Rubenstein was it. So, and when, when we got 300 and some marijuana cases in one year, um, right. that's overwhelming to even three people who are doing the cases. So. And part of the issue is if you have a lot of the people who would be qualified locally, if you if you were to be one of our hearings officers, you essentially would be ethically prohibited from representing people before the county. And so, like, if, for example, we have some local land use attorneys who are really good land use attorneys who understand code enforcement and land use. But as attorneys, they can't both be a judge and practice before the body in which they would be a judge, even if they're not a judge. And so it, you have to sort of find people who have experience and knowledge, but who don't, who don't want to continue to act as local work. So if I'll give you copies of the information we have. I don't know if you guys want to talk about I mean, procedurally, we can interview people and bring a record, you know, bring people to you to consider for approval, or we can change that if you want. You, you all, I mean, this ordinance isn't going to get dropped and changed immediately. So, while in the interim, at least what's going on is going to go on. So, if you all want to have interviews with the people who apply, who are being considered, we can change that process and set that up for you. Um, or we can just do what we've always done and, you know, bring you people for consideration for appointment. So I don't know if you if you don't tell me you do something else I'm going to do what we've been doing. Until <laughs> <laughs> we dissolve 294, we'll keep doing what we're doing. I guess. Yeah. And then you you talked about setting up a meeting. Do you want us to set up a That'd meeting? Be good. Do you want to meet with them individually, one at a time? You know, probably going to be hard for you to get them all three here at once. Frankly, they, they all have a, they all have jobs and they uh, do. I think or or do, be fine. do hearings, yeah. so what we could do is rotate them on a yeah. quarterly, quarterly basis, basis or something. Mm -hmm. And I can I can have uh, Ted, you know, work with them on their schedule so that they can show up and talk. I mean, we we would just notice it as part of the meeting, discussing with hearings officer Whitlock or whatever. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think from everything else you said, what else you may want us to do. So you, do you want us to set those up? I think, yeah, as until something else happens, I would think that would be beneficial to, to at least, you know, face-to-face -face with them. And, and if there's issues to talk about, great. If not, it's just a little, hey, how you doing? The other thing that we could do if you want, and, you know, I can get you all the financial data depending on what you want. I mean, I don't want to <laughs> put staff to work gathering, you know, hundreds of pages of financial information that you really wouldn't use, but if there's certain things you want to know, we can put that together. And also, um, I don't, I don't believe. I mean, anyone could probably check the docket for what's the room scheduled for for hearings. But we could also provide the board notice of what hearings are, what days. Uh, Tuesday, Thursdays during our meeting. Tuesday, there are Tuesday, Thursdays. Yeah, was yeah, nice but when our meeting didn't happen, I could go. Right, but what I'm telling you is, I don't know that you get that information. I maybe no, we don't. Out. So, is that something you would sure. like us to do? Yes. Very. And the financial stuff, meeting. I would just think even in a future audit, um, especially looking over the marijuana stuff, if we'd want the audit numbers, like. Well, we're doing. You know, you, you all approved the audit plan, so right. I'm assuming you know we're doing a full-fledged audit on all the impacts mm -hmm. of marijuana to the county in this audit year. Right. Including? It'll in include South. this, it'll include, you know, like, for example, our surveyor's office has been out probably hundreds of times because these people just rip out the survey markers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's a there's a significant cost every time we go out. I think it's 2500 bucks per survey marker that some marijuana grower dug out of the ground, you know, trading their property or whatever. I mean, they're not supposed to do that, but they do it. And there's all these costs. So mm -hmm. we're looking at all okay. those things, and it will include code, and it will also include revenues because, you know, there are some revenues the county derives. I mean, when people make a land, land use application or want a lux or um, when they're in violation and pay a fine or all that, you know, the tax revenue, yeah, all that, all that 20000 in tax revenue that we are getting. Um, but all of that will be contained in the audit. And i got to tell you that I don't know that that audit will get done this year because it's a lot to yeah. look at, but we are doing it. If you wanted just a separate audit on this, which seems redundant to me mm -mm. if we're going to do it, but it's just going to be a lot. I'm telling you, like, if you wanted something real soon, you would need to direct us to do something good. Well, we'll just looking at it is good. <clears throat> and then looking at our options. And process of circuit court. Yeah. So right now, I'll just uh, I will put together some uh, 
know, I think it would be a sample process for circuit court, what it would look like, and then some estimated costs at that time, and what it would cost defendants, et cetera, to participate in that, and then whether, how, and whether using justice court would be an option. Thank you. And I also think we should look at um, timelines for civil cases in certain Th yeah, yeah, that would be not, not just to the first but hearing, you know, but how long typically total resolution. And it's going to be an estimate and an average. Mm -hmm. But I, my, my guess is that it will be well over a year. Mm -hmm. right? And, and, it, and it's, you know, it, I, I can talk to the courts to see what, what their estimate is. Okay. But, but procedurally, so that, so that you know, I mean, people just don't show up one day and have a hearing, right? right. I mean, you realize there'll be evidentiary. People could ask for depositions. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that could go on. Whatever could, they want to pay for, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I'm just telling you, like, that can all extend the length of yeah. and, and the cost. Right. And just so you know, um, the most updated email I got from Bob Pecker was um, civil cases. Uh, in 2016, terminated cases within 12 months was 90%. That's all 90%. There are 88. So. Well, and, and that, so just to give you some concept. That includes settlements. Yeah. yeah. So I think, nine, I think what's the current number, 95% of all civil cases that are getting filed end up getting settled before trial. Mm -hmm. um, how we currently do our process, um, we try to settle our code enforcement cases before we file. And so uh, my, my strong thought would be is we're not going to see that sort of 95% reduction. We're probably going to have very, very few cases settled because for the most part, unless we change how we handle code enforcement processes, we don't file it if there's any opportunity to settle or to get compliance. And if we filed all of them, then we'd be talking about several. I, mean, I don't think we have to file all of them if we are getting compliance. So the, so the 150 that we talked about, that is the 150 that could not be resolved with compliance. Mm -hmm. And so my, my best guess would be all 150 of those will go to circuit court and probably 140 to 145 of them will go to a trial. Yeah, well, because Okay. Because they, because they're, they're, we're not going to get a 95 percent reduction in the settlement because our case closure because we tried to do that before we even filed on the front end. I mean, what would happen? Just like what happens in a hearings officer, if people comply, we would drop the case, and that happens. So some of the times when people get scheduled for a hearing, they go, "Oh, I better take care of this," and they go do whatever they need to do, and so they end up not having the hearing. Why is it 140 out of the That would be good. Okay. You think just 10? I don't know. In circuit court, it might be more because it really will cost people more money. Yeah. Thank you for the discussion. Anything else about 294? No. Okay. Next item is the citizen, citizen Committee nominations. Thanks, Laura. So you have in your packet the list sent over um, by the county clerk of the Board of Property Tax Appeals for the review. Five of the members from last year um, are interested in being reappointed, and nine thank you for recommended for appointment. He was asked last year, but he has been prior. So that's one of the items for discussion today, and then also, you have a public safety coordinating council. Um, there's three people that have been recommended by the committee that wish to remain, so they're all just reappointments. And that's Dave Carter, Lee Ayers, and Rita Sullivan. So, Rita's was just like a, I don't know what the, the requirements are. Is that a Rita a is a citizen, a citizen member. Okay. Um, I guess I would question hers. Is that um, well? I do think she was a citizen member before because of her position. Is what I'm, and I'm sure you're getting the same thing. That it was filled the position of a, just a, a citizen at large, but she filled that position because of her position with contract at the time. Well, no, not technically. I mean, technically, you have representatives of alcohol and drug in um, I think Asia. Uh, right, Stoner. Stoner was the member. Actually, I think he actually made Asia a citizen member, too. It may have been Chris Mason. Or I can't remember who was the mm -hmm. AD rep. I will say this. This was discussed at the PSCC Oversight Committee, and I don't know if Commissioner Strasser was there or not. But the issue was whether or not Rita had any 
administrative sanctions or mm -hmm. criminal charges or anything brought against her, and there wasn't. The district attorney was the chair of the PSCC at the time that uh, Beth was at the time that they reviewed her application. They asked her if she wanted to be renewed, and she said she did want to be renewed, and there's been no penalties imposed against her. In other words, you know, she's been found to have done, she's not been found to have done something, you know, improper. Uh, the committee, the committee so committee she got pointer. I guess that's a, I mean, to me. And there was been any other applications or recommendations? Well, you, you, yeah, there's other people, but this is an, uh, uh, citizen member, and you guys have no limit. You have a minimum of citizen members, but no limit on the amount. I mean, oh. you, you could have 20 or 30 or 40 citizen members if you want. Was there other applications for citizen members? <coughs> Not that I have Not any information on. I just have the three reappointments recommended by the committee that wish to remain members. Who are the other two? Dave Carter and Lee Ayers. Yeah, isn't Dave Carter a citizen member? I don't have any of that information. I actually think Lee Ayers is a citizen member, too. Oh. So if there were others, it wouldn't impede anything. No, it's not like there's only a certain number of spots. There is a minimum number of citizen members. I can't remember if it's six or five. It used to be three. I think the, a prior board before I even got here extended it to five minimum. So that's all it says in the ordinance. But okay. there's not a maximum. So if someone else wanted to be on there and be a citizen member, they could. Well, if that committee thinks she's valuable to the conversation, I say then that's fine with me. Well, that's what it kind of comes down to. It's mm -hmm. a recommendation. Okay. And the other two, yeah, I don't have much with those either. Okay, and also the same recommendations approved? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. One of those stuff seen since I've been here where I knew every single person on it. <laughs> then you'll have to say the names. A lot of realtors. A lot of real estate people on there. Well, lender, realtor, yeah. realtor, tired. Right. Anything for executive sessions? Yeah. Yeah. Anything, Danny, for Dick? Okay, then our meeting is adjourned.